I've written a number of papers about the benefits of polyphenols in making blood vessels flexible. There is an old expression in longevity that you are only as young as your blood vessels are flexible. And we have a number of ways that we can measure this in the clinic, either with blood tests or with devices called an endopat. Um, and you want your blood vessels to be um, not lined with, uh, I'm old enough to remember what was called flypaper um, stickiness. Um, in terms of causing heart disease, uh, you have to really have two things. You have to have inflammation on the inside of blood vessels, and you have to have cholesterol that's oxidized, that's interested in sticking to inflammation. And I've written a number of papers that show that polyphenols in, for example, uh, grapeseed extract in uh, what's called pycnogenol, French maritime tree bark, uh, actually reverses stickiness in blood vessels and actually promotes flexibility in blood vessels. And those are just two examples, but I think most people uh, need to supplement with uh, a few concentrated forms of polyphenols. And a lot of them will do the job. It just so happens when I started this that Things like grapeseed extract and pycnogenol were readily available at Trader Joe's and Costco even. And so we'd send folks out for these things and then look at what happened to them. And lo and behold, uh, things got a whole lot better. And then a lot of people would go, oh, okay, you know, my blood vessels are great now and uh, I'm not sticky on my blood vessels, so I don't need these things anymore. And so they'd stop taking them. And three months later, we'd measure them and go, what the heck? You had such beautiful blood vessels and they weren't sticky and now they're all sticky again. And they go, oh, well, I didn't know I needed to keep taking that. You just told me, you know, let's, and it was fine. So I stopped doing it. And so then we'd go, okay, back on it. We'll see in three months, lo and behold, it was fine again. And, and so we'd publish these results. So I guess one of the points is, I'm a guy who used to think supplements made expensive urine. I, re I really did. But through the years, we've actually been able to measure the effect of the supplements on either blood level or something that we were we wanted to see flexibility. And they don't make expensive urine. In the example you gave there with patients, you know, coming off those supplements and then their levels dipping. It sounds like for polyphenols, we need to consider and take a supplement to make sure we're getting enough. But do you find certain people that have are eating certain diets and have a healthy enough lifestyle and they're eating, you know, a wide range of, of healthy vegetables and fruits and healthy protein? The way I understand it, polyphenols, they mostly come from from plants. Correct. But if it is in different color plants, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So if people are eating a wide range of colorful plants, do they need to supplement on top of that, do you find? Well, um, hunter-gatherers, the last that are remaining in general, consume up to 250 different plant species on a rotating basis throughout the year. And if you think the average, even organic eater is usually only consuming about 20 different fruits and vegetables. So if you think that you can acquire the polyphenols that hunter-gatherers do in 250 different plants, eating an organic diet, I have oceanfront property here in Palm Springs to sell you right now. I really don't think it can be done. Uh, you can certainly try, but uh, again, our soils are just so decimated. The other thing that's fascinating, look at looking at long-lived people, is a, a lot of these people, as I write about in the last book and in the upcoming book, uh, these are sheep and goat herders. And one of the really interesting things about these people is they will actively feed their goats and sheep 
uh, various herbs that they literally go and gather and f literally hand feed them. And you go, well, what the heck are they doing that for? Well, you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. And so these guys are using their animals as conduits for polyphenols that they might not otherwise eat in quantity, but these animals put these polyphenols in their milk, and interestingly, they put it in their flesh when they eat them. In fact, years ago, um, the Swiss did a fascinating study looking at active polyphenols in cheeses. And they looked at the polyphenol content in cheeses that were made from uh, cows grazing in high alpine meadows during the spring and fall versus cows that were kept on fodder down below. And there was like 10 times more active polyphenols in these cows that were grazed on high alpine pasture. And back in the good old days, there was actually a law to make Parmesan cheese. You could only make Parmesan cheese from spring and fall grass-fed cows. And you couldn't make, you couldn't declare it Parmesan cheese in summer uh, or you know, winter because they were fed fodder. Now, economics being what it is, you can make Parmesan cheese year round now and still label it Parmesan cheese, Parmesan or Reggiano. But it's really interesting how these cultures, and I talk about this extensively in the new book, knew that there was something that was beneficial by doing all this. And they were, you know, how they knew, I think they just felt better. But they knew. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about in the new book. How that's so these fascinating. It. So we know polyphenols can be taken in by the animal, passed to us through dairy. Do they get in the meat as well? Just to clarify that. Yeah. And we think that that's a number of reasons why carnivores uh, actually acquired their polyphenols from the products that they ate. And in fact, one of the fascinating things, and I wrote about this long ago, you watch a great carnivore, like a lion, uh, they actually eat the insides out first. And they actually eat all the guts, including the gut contents first. And even hunter-gatherers actually spend a lot of time consuming the innards of the animals they kill. And they even roll in it. They smear their bodies with, with this stuff. So that's, you know, you go, and for instance, I have four dogs. Uh, it's spring. My dogs love the little, fine, fresh little grass. They'll, they'll seek it out. They'll pull me, you know, oh, let's go get some of that stuff. Now, if they want to throw up, they eat, you know, mature grass. But they're looking, the, the little stuff doesn't have very many lectins, and they're looking for these plant compounds. Just as a little caveat, as we talk about quality of of meat in containing polyphenols, the potential there, it gets me thinking back to when we were talking about fish oils. And just to re-highlight that point I was trying to make before, this is why I'm a little bit weary about brands like Kirkland, because if we know that the meat is so influenced and then the oil that's pressed from that by what the animals ate, we need to follow that all the way back if we want to be certain that we're getting good quality. And again, well, that's we, why I'm just a little bit wary about brands well, from Costco. Yeah, you're looking for small fish. You're looking for anchovies, sardines, Mad Hatton, um, and re it'll show on the label where it came from. You don't want large fish, fish oil. But what about fish that are farmed and they're fed like whatever they feed them, grains and well, versus fish that are caught in the wild? That's a great question, but it's interesting. We now are sadly realizing that a farm-raised salmon uh, don't make um, much omega-3 fats. Uh, they actually are fed corn and soybeans primarily, and they make now omega-6 fats uh, from that, sadly. So uh, 
Back in the good old days, farmed fish were actually fed ground up fish. And it became far too expensive uh, to do that. In fact, I, I trained in one in England for a year back in the 80s in children's surgery. And the English had such amount of fish that they actually fed their chickens fish meal, ground up fish meal. And I wrote about this in one of my books, uh, two young children, and they really missed Kentucky Fried Chicken. And the first Kentucky Fried Chicken opened in London. And so we got on and my kids were excited. You know, they were five and seven. And they said, oh, boy, you know, let's go get for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we got on the tube and we, we went out there and they both bit into a leg. And they go, oh, you know, this isn't chicken, this is fish. And I go, no, 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 no. And they look, you know, it's a chicken leg. Look, that's a chicken. No, you know, he fooled us. It's fish. Well, the fish, the chicken was what it ate. And it ate fish. And it was literally a fish. It, the, the, the flesh was translucent. And it literally smelled like fish. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. So what we're learning, sadly, is yeah, you can have microscopic, you know, nano molecules of these things, but because they never detach.